Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anita Nielsen, and I'm the Senior Director for Annual and Plan Giving at Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our first behind the scenes lecture of 2013. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as many of you know, we're in our seventh consecutive year of delivering this lecture series, and we have covered a very wide spectrum of topics from arthritis to ophthalmology to cardiovascular disease and many others. But the innovations and the excellence in patient care that we are so well known for would not be possible without the generous support of our donors and so we thank you very, very much for your ongoing support. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Gary Lewis. For many of you, uh, you will have received our, uh, our um, biannual newsletter report on your support. And uh, this edition is all about diabetes. Dr. Lewis is featured on the cover. And he is also with his esteemed colleagues, Dr. Christina Nostro, who holds the Harry Rosen Chair in Diabetes Regenerative Medicine at the McEwen Center for Regenerative Medicine. And also Dr. Bruce Perkins, who is an endocrinologist here at UHN. Today, Dr. Lewis will share with you some of the vital work that's being done at Toronto General and Western Hospitals to advance the prevention, treatment, and care of diabetes and what you should all know about the disease. So now I would like to call upon Louise Aspen, our Vice President of Advancement at Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation to say a few words about today's generous sponsor, Sun Life Financial. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Louise Aspen, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Development Officer of the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here today uh, on behalf of our foundation and all of the people who've worked so hard to build our extraordinary relationship with uh, Sun Life Financial. So on behalf of the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sun Life Financial for their incredible gift of $5 million to open new doors for research and prevention of diabetes, which is fast becoming the epidemic of the 21st century. So we're incredibly fortunate today to have a group of representatives from Sun Life uh, with us, including Mary DePally, Linda McKenzie, Paul Joliet, Jennifer McIntosh, Stephanie Lupinacci, Catherine Melville, Brenda Spearing, and Laurie Castleman. So welcome, and thank you for coming. One individual who has played a very key role in helping us to build this partnership is Dr. Michael Baker, who is uh, an incredible foundation volunteer and holder of the Rose Family Chair in Complex Care at University Health Network. Dr. Baker's list of accomplishments and accolades is unparalleled, but I would be remiss if I didn't name a few, including former Physician-in-Chief, University Health Network, co-chair of our Foundation's Partners for Discovery Society, professor of medicine at the University of Toronto, and a member of both the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Michael Baker. Thank you, Louise. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on behalf of the University Health Network, uh, affectionately known as the empire that ate downtown Toronto, but um, we just merged with Toronto Rehab Institute and we're continuing to expand. At UHN, we have a, a legacy of diabetes research that dates back to 1921 with the groundbreaking discovery of insulin by doctors Banting and Best. Since then, UHN has built one of the largest concentrations of diabetes, clinical, research, and educational activities in the world, and certainly the most significant in Canada. Thanks to Sun Life's commitment to wellness in Canada, diabetes prevention and awareness can now receive the attention it so greatly needs and deserves. So I'd like to echo Louise's sentiments and say thank you, Sun Life Financial, for your extraordinary commitment. I was at a... Uh, fundraising event um, uh, last week sponsored by Sun Life and I actually sang that thank you but at by special request I've been asked not to sing the thank you 
today, so I won't. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Dr. Gary Lewis. Dr. Lewis completed his medical training in 1982 in South Africa, followed by specialty training in internal medicine and then endocrinology at the University of Toronto. His entire success is due to uh, the fact that his uh, mom took good care of him when he was a little kid and made sure he did his homework. And she's with us today, Mrs. Robin Lewis. This is not in the script. I just thought there is no way I'm not going to mention that with Mrs. Lewis in the audience. Thank you. She offered to tell me many scary and embarrassing stories about Gary, but uh, Gary gave her one of those looks, and I didn't uh, get any stories. The one about stealing the car, you'll have to tell me later because I need, I'll need that for some future uh, talk. <laughs> Gary's been here with us in Toronto since 1990, first joining the staff of Toronto General Hospital, and la later serving as the head of the Division of Endocrinology for UHN and Mount Sinai Hospitals until last year. In addition, Dr. Lewis is director of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at University of Toronto and director of the Banting and Best Diabetes Center, also at University of Toronto, centered here at UHN. Just last year, Dr. Lewis was appointed as the inaugural Sun Life Chair in Diabetes, thanks to that generous donation. He's considered one of the foremost experts in the abnormalities of cholesterol and blood fats in those affected by diabetes, factors which ultimately lead to heart disease. Through this research, he and his colleagues have made a number of important discoveries and have contributed greatly to the understanding of this phenomenon. Now, before we welcome Dr. Lewis to the stage, please turn your attention to the video screens overhead for a quick four-minute video. The rates are absolutely astounding. The actual disease is an epidemic. Now, before we welcome Dr. Lewis, to the video screens overhead for a quick video. The rates are absolutely astounding. The actual disease is in epidemic proportions. It had never crossed my mind that I would be in a risk of diabetes at all. I was quite terrified, actually. I uh, didn't know much about diabetes when I was diagnosed with it, and I pretty much thought that that was a sign of, uh, OK, get ready, you've got a few years to live. The situation around diabetes in this country is serious, and it is only getting worse. People are saying, where's the cure? How come nothing's changed? A lot has changed. We can really manage diabetes very well, but we're not there yet. I'm Christy, and two years ago I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes. I'm Everett Anstey. I'm a diabetic. I have type 2 diabetes. I've had it for 25 plus years. I'm Dr. Gary Lewis. I'm the director of the Division of Endocrinology at the University of Toronto, and I'm also the director of the Banting and Best Diabetes Center at the University of Toronto. Hello, Krista. Hello. Hi, Celeste. How are you? Type 2 diabetes, which is the type that affects about 90% of all people with diabetes, is strongly genetic. And type 2 diabetes is linked to lifestyle changes. And I found myself weighing almost 300 pounds and <clears throat> suffering with chronic headaches and back pain. Increasing body weight and less physical activity in a susceptible individual is what really can bring on type 2 diabetes. I am Mary DePauli, Executive Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, and Head of Public and Corporate Affairs for Sun Life Financial. We can make a difference. We can make a difference through our employees. We can make a difference through our philanthropic giving. We can make a difference through awareness and prevention. For type 2 diabetes, there's tremendous 
self-management required and tremendous self-motivation. That's the tough part. Yeah, it was difficult. It's a day-by-day -day process. You have to decide every day to make good decisions. We have tremendous experience around wellness programs that we have implemented across the country where we can see the real impact between changing your life in a very simple way through diet and exercise and the tremendous impact that it has down the road on your health and on your well-being as an individual and on your family as well. One of the best parts is that there's a gym uh, at my office so I'm able to work out during the day. People like Christy and Everett are just shining examples of how hard work and focus to manage the disease and get it under control can really have significant benefits on someone's life. My blood work has come back um, completely clear. There's no sign of raised insulin levels at all in my blood. I eat healthy every day. I have a total clean bill of health. No more prediabetes, no back pain, no headaches. I think we're at a, in a transformative time. First of all, in terms of basic research, it's never been a more exciting time. I went from thinking that I was dying with diabetes to living with diabetes. With all the treatments that are available now, make it a lot easier. We're going to be making significant donations right across the country, starting with the Banting and Best Clinic at the University Health Network. I feel like we're at an inflection point, and I think the Sun Life contribution is quite significant in this. And when you think about the fact that Sun Life today touches one in four Canadians, we believe that this will allow us to reach Canadians in a way with messages of prevention and wellness and awareness to stem the impact of this disease. I um, ran a 5K uh, in January last year and then in June of this year I did my first triathlon and then in September of this year I did my first strongman competition. I'm feeling wonderful. I'm about to head south, so... Uh... I'm really proud of myself, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the spring 2013 behind-the-scenes lecturer, Dr. Gary Lewis. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Thank you all for coming, and that's the last time I ever invite my mother to a public forum. I didn't realize how dangerous that could be. Let's just go back to number, yeah, there we go. Just get the slides up and uh, we'll get going. There we go, um, this one. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so for the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes, um, here's what uh, I'm going to be telling you. First of all, we'll have a little 101 on diabetes. Very, very simple. Just uh, I know that the majority of people here really, uh, their level of understanding is way above this. But for those of you who, um, who don't really understand what diabetes is, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about this magnificent discovery of insulin in Toronto in 1921. Um, what underlies the diabetic epidemic that you've just heard about? How we are addressing the problem at the University Health Network and University of Toronto, and then we'll have some time for questions. So first of all, what is diabetes? Well, simply put, diabetes occurs when the pancreas fails to produce enough insulin and without insulin, our bodies do not function. So the pancreas is this fleshy organ that uh, you see here. It's, um, it's in the stomach, at the back of the uh, stomach, uh, just in front of the spine, and uh, it's about this big. And uh, there's two parts to it. There's a part that makes enzymes that go right into the bowel that help digest the food that we eat. But scattered throughout the pancreas are uh, little cells in clumps called islets. And in those cells, amongst those cells, are the cells that make insulin. Insulin plays an absolutely essential action. It's very important for our bodies to have enough energy to function. And if without insulin, we're unable to move, to work, to breathe, 
So insulin has to get from the bloodstream into the cells, from, uh, glucose has to get from the bloodstream into the cells, and insulin plays a very, very important role in that. There is a difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes and its classic form really affects children and adolescents, usually up to about age 35. It's very dramatic in its onset. It occurs over a few weeks to a few months. And it occurs when there is a loss of these cells that make insulin in the, uh, in the pancreas. The um, cells are destroyed by the body's immune system. We don't really understand why that happens, how it happens, or why certain people get type 1 diabetes and not others. And people with type 1 diabetes have an absolute requirement for insulin really from the beginning, and they need insulin for the rest of their lives. Um, type 2 diabetes usually develops in adulthood, although as I'll show you in a few minutes, we're starting to see cases in childhood and adolescence as well. In this case, the pancreas also cannot produce enough insulin, um, but in addition, there's this problem called insulin resistance where the body cannot effectively use the insulin that it produces. So the body is resistant to that insulin. In the early stages, we can treat type 2 diabetes with diet and exercise, and in later stages, we treat it with medications, tablets, and in a certain number of people, maybe 50% of people with type 2 diabetes will eventually require insulin. 90% of all the people with diabetes, in fact, have type 2 diabetes. The, the biggest problem, believe it or not, in type 2 diabetes is the risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. And even in the pre-diabetic or, or borderline diabetic state, there's a very high risk of cardiovascular disease. At the time of diagnosis, so this is often, uh, a person may not know that they've got diabetes unless they're having regular blood tests uh, by their family physician. And so sometimes we diagnose diabetes when it's already been present for quite a long time because it may not be associated with any symptoms. And so people may have complications of diabetes even at the time of diagnosis. Now, diabetes is a very serious illness. In actual fact, it is the leading cause in Canada of blindness, end-stage kidney failure, nerve damage, which often results in limb amputations, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. I'm actually going to, however, tell you a very hopeful message today. So this is the horrible part of diabetes, the part that we all dread. It could lead to that. But I'm going to tell you that um, we currently have the means to take care of diabetes very, very well. And um, many of our patients, uh, following the directions they get from their family physician or their diabetes specialist can remain very well uh, for an entire lifetime. So the message I'm going to give you is not one of horror, but it's very important to realize that this is a very serious disease, particularly if not well treated. First of all, let me tell you about uh, a story um, that happened right here where you're sitting in the uh, Toronto General Hospital at the University of Toronto in the Department of Physiology. Um, just more than 90 years ago. And this has been ranked, the, the, the discovery of insulin, for those of you who don't know, occurred right here in Toronto at this university and has been ranked the number one medical achievement of the 20th century by some. And the first treatment occurred in this very hospital. And that's a picture of Banting and Best with their famous uh, dog, Marjorie, on the roof of the old uh, building that used to stand here. So before insulin was discovered, type 1 diabetes, the, chi the childhood type that I told you about, was uniformly fatal. These pictures are reminiscent of pictures that we've seen of uh, people, uh, for example, from concentration camps and the Holocaust. So um, as with HIV, before the discovery of antiretroviral therapies in about 1996, this disease, before 1921, doctors would made, make feeble attempts to treat with diet, restrictions. Mo most, of it uh, most of it was hocus pocus, and eventually the poor child would succumb to what we call diabetic ketoacidosis or waste away. 
Banting had read an interesting article and been to a lecture, and a year before the discovery of insulin in 1920, and he was a, a surgeon um, from London, Ontario, and he woke up in the middle, middle of the night having a, 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 a dream and a thought that he would do an experiment in dogs and tie off that duct that I just showed you, the pancreatic duct, and that the rest of the pancreas uh, he would be able to isolate insulin from the rest of the pancreas because the part that makes enzymes would, uh, what we call atrophy and go away. And he approached um, McLeod, who was actually a very well-known uh, researcher at the time and the head of the Department of Physiology at the University of Toronto. So it was not just a coincidence that insulin was discovered in Toronto. In actual fact, this was exactly the right setting. And today, in the year uh, 2013, we're trying once again to create the right setting for breakthrough discoveries, and I'll tell you about those towards the end of my talk. So not only did we have uh, the infrastructure at, uh, at the University of Toronto, but in addition, Connaught Labs was here, and they, they were to play a critical role in the production of insulin. And so Banting approached McLeod, and McLeod gave him some lab space in uh, early uh, two, 1921, and um, a medical student, Charlie Best, who's seen there on the left, came to work with Banting and they did their initial experiments in dogs by tying off the pancreatic duct and trying to isolate a substance from the pancreas, insulin, and these are some of their notes from their first experiments. And actually, you can see here in this, in this graph, you can see that blood sugar that they used to measure with very primitive means actually declined in a dog that had diabetes, and that was one of the first demonstrations that their pancreatic e extract may work. And Leonard Thompson was a young boy who looked like those pictures I just showed you, who was dying, basically, with uh, uh, type 1 diabetes. He weighed 67 uh, pounds at the time that they started to treat him. And they had the first extract ready to treat him in um, January 1922. Actually, it turned out that that first shot of insulin didn't work, and it caused big abscesses, and so they sent... Uh, there was another individual, a, a fourth individual you need to know about. His name was uh, Collip, and he was a biochemist who actually was on sabbatical from the University of Alberta, and uh, a brilliant biochemist who went on to make many other discoveries of new uh, discoveries of, of hormones, who actually was the one, as far as many of us are concerned, who really purified insulin, and they sent Collip back to the lab he probably had a cot in the lab, and he wasn't allowed to go home until, and then 12 days later, he came up with a more pure uh, substance, and they injected it into Leonard Thompson, and his blood sugar started to come down. And uh, so there's these beautiful stories of these early in, uh, resurrections of people who were dying, usually children in the beginning, but then adults began to be treated as well. And these beautiful stories, uh, I can't really read it um, here, but it's something like, Dear Dr. Banting, hope you arrived safe and sound. Uh, the same day you left, I gathered some uh, nerve together and gave myself um, uh, insulin and doing it ever since. And, and uh, very sweet letters here to the doctor who cures diabetes. And some of these were um, very uh, famous uh, people as well. Uh, like Elizabeth Hughes, who was the daughter of the Secretary of State of the United States. And uh, so we started to see people um, living who would have uh, been condemned, really, to death with this terrible disease. Uh, now the pressure was on, and they had to produce enough, and the re um, requests were coming in from all over the world to send insulin, and uh, this is where Carnot Labs, the University of Toronto Labs, and then the pharmaceutical industry started to step in and produce enough insulin for everyone. And the whole pricing of insulin is a very interesting story. The Nobel Prize followed shortly thereafter in 1923 and was actually awarded initially to Banting and McLeod. And there was uh, a lot of dispute over who actually made the discovery. And Banting felt that Charlie Best had played a major role, so he split his prize with Charlie Best, and Banting split his with Collip, and there was a lot of fractious uh, uh, business that went on between them afterwards. That's another whole interesting and uh, not uh, uh, very glorious story, but um, 
this was the beginning of a new era. In fact, it wasn't just the discovery of insulin. It was actually one of the first major medical discoveries where doctors could actually do something. Remember, this is before the discovery of antibiotics, modern surgical techniques, and many of the things um, that we now take for granted. So to be perfectly frank, doctors, as skilled as they were at the time, couldn't do much for patients. And in fact, uh, the discovery of insulin kicked off an entire new era in uh, medicine. And of course, this is uh, one of Canada's greatest medical discoveries. Now, what about diabetes in the 21st century? And what is this epidemic? And why do we have an epidemic? Let's just talk about that. So first of all, some staggering statistics. Now, one in four Canadians are affected by diabetes. By that, I do not mean that one in four Canadians has diabetes. The actual prevalence of diabetes in the population is around about seven or eight percent. Okay, so seven or eight percent of Canadians have diabetes. But many, many people have borderline or pre-diabetes, and about 50% of them are going to develop diabetes in their lifetime. So we estimate about one in four Canadians actually have some abnormality that at least either they have diabetes or predisposes them to diabetes. Of course, if you read this slide a different way and you said, who is not affected by a close, a loved one, a family member, uh, or either the, or themselves, uh, virtually everybody in this country is affected by this disease. Here are some numbers. By the year 2030, 438 million people are expected to have diabetes. 41% of Canadians worry that their children will get diabetes. Um, it is the contributing factor in over 40,000 Ontario deaths per year. Direct diabetes treatment consumes more than 15% of our healthcare budget, and almost three million Canadians already have diabetes, but about a million don't even know that they've got diabetes. I'd like to acknowledge the first, the next few slides are actually um, produced by my colleague, um, Dr. Stuart Harris, who's a very well-known uh, primary care provider who, uh, who has expertise in diabetes. He's at the, um, in London, Ontario, at the University of Western Ontario. So I'll thank him for these excellent uh, next few slides that I'm going to show. And in 2020, it's estimated that diabetes will cost the Canadian healthcare system almost $20 billion per year. It is a worldwide epidemic. In actual fact, most new cases are going to come from China, India, and uh, other developing countries. So if you look at this, in 2003, um, 3.8 billion uh, people in the world, um, 5.3 billion by 2025, that's the adult, po the adult population. Adults with diabetes, um, if you have a look, it's going to go from 194 million to 333 million, and many people feel this is an underestimate. We've underestimated, uh, underestimated the number of people. And as I said, the number of people with diabetes is just a fraction of all of those with um, impaired glucose tolerance or borderline diabetes. So what are some of the factors impacting diabetes prevalence and incidence in Canada, and why do we have this problem? So first of all, we have, and I'm gonna speak about each one of these factors. We have an aging population. We have increased immigration from high-risk populations. We'll, we'll cover all of these. We have aboriginal population growth, where there's very high prevalence of diabetes. There's an increasing prevalence of childhood and adult obesity. And there are socioeconomic and environmental factors that are playing into this that cause this epidemic. So first of all, the aging of the population. Diabetes is a disease of aging. The incidence really increases with age, and it increases sharply around middle age. In 2006, seniors accounted for 13.7% of the total population, but by 2031, seniors will account for 24%, almost double the 2006 levels. 
we have immigration from high-risk populations. You look around in a city like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and uh, we know that people from Asia and particularly from uh, South Asia um, are at very high natural risk for the developing diabetes, but also people from Africa and Central South America and Caribbean. So this is also contributing to the epidemic. The Aboriginal population is at extremely high risk. They've gone from almost no diabetes 100 years ago to almost 50% of their population having diabetes. So Aboriginal Canadians have three to five times higher rates of diabetes than the general population. Due primarily to a high birth rate from 1996 to 2003, the Aboriginal population grew by 45% is nearly six times the growth rate of non-Aboriginals, and the highest concentration of Aboriginal peoples in 2001 was in the prairie, prairie provinces and the north. Obesity is driving this epidemic. These are the curves of obesity, and what's astounding is the short period that this has increased. This graph only goes, you can see, from something happened in about 1980, round about then, that the, the, the rates really took off. And so many, many of the uh, population is now regarded in the category as being obese. Canadian children are not active enough. So only 21% of Canadian teenagers, 27% of boys, 14% of girls are active enough to meet international guidelines for optimal growth and development. And only 20% of Canadian children receive daily physical education in school. Childhood obesity in Canada, we know that obese children tend to remain obese as adults. And the prevalence of adult obesity will likely increase as current generation of children enters adulthood. Our lifestyle puts us at risk. We, uh, some people call this a toxic lifestyle. Inactivity increases insulin resistance, which is intimately linked to type 2 diabetes, as I showed you earlier. Only 49% of Canadians age 20 and above are at least moderately active during their leisure time. Every two hours per day of television watching has been shown to be associated with a 14% increase in the risk of type 2 diabetes. And every hour of brisk walking per day has been associated with a 34% reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes. So there's no question diabetes is the epidemic of the 21st century, but there are also socioeconomic and environmental factors that are important. Certainly, you can be very wealthy and have diabetes, no question about that. Uh, you can be very poor and not have diabetes. But generally speaking, there is a greater risk of diabetes or there's a greater prevalence of diabetes amongst lower socioeconomic uh, groups. So high income tends to be protective against diabetes. Let me explain that. It's not that if you're at risk, you go and earn more, and now you're at less risk. It means that if we do a survey of a population, we find less risk in the higher. E even we can, there are interesting maps of a city of Toronto that really shows you that even within the, the city of greater Toronto, there's huge differences in prevalence, and it does uh, coincide with lower socioeconomic status. It's disproportionately clustered in lower socioeconomic status quintiles, in neighborhoods with lower average household incomes, high proportions of visible minorities and or recent immigrants. There are lots of interesting theories as to why this occurs, whether it's diet or some genetics um, of some immigrant populations, uh, lack of exercise, et cetera. There are lots of theories, but we don't really fully understand it. Um, and there is greater smoking, et cetera. So the final part of my talk, I'm just going to touch on what we are doing at the University Health Network and the University of Toronto Banting and Best Diabetes Center, uh, and what our vision is for a cure and improving the lives of those with diabetes. So I'm going to talk about nine research programs now, and this is the first one I'm talking about. And I've got pictures of some of the leaders of these programs who are at the University of Toronto. And here you heard from um, uh, a little bit earlier that we have um, experts in diabetes stem cell disease, uh, excuse me, stem cell biology, where um, there is the McEwen Center at, uh, actually in this building upstairs, uh, 
is the McEwen Center, and this center is dedicated towards discoveries using stem cells to, for example, cure a disease like diabetes. So a stem cell, by the way, no longer has to be taken from embryos. We now have techniques where you could take a skin cell from a person, and with sophisticated molecular biology, you can take that uh, skin cell, which is a differentiated cell, right back to a cell that doesn't know what it wants to be when it gets big. So a stem cell is a cell that can become any kind of cell. So a brilliant breakthrough a few years ago that, uh, uh, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded. So now there shouldn't be any ethical issues with stem cells. And our group here, Christina Nostro and Gordon Keller, who are leaders in the world, have taken the cell step by step by step, understanding bio, uh, embryology, and have made these cells into the precursors of a pancreatic uh, islet. So we've got this far on the road, and now they can take these cells and implant it into a mouse, and about six months later, take those cells and show that these have become proper islets that make insulin and secrete the insulin. This is a tremendous breakthrough. We're not yet ready for prime time. In order for these to be ready to transplant into humans to cure diabetes, they would need to figure out these two or, or many um, red arrows here. They need to do this in the dish. They need to take this pancreatic progenitor this precursor, and step by step by step, take it to an islet cell. Right now, these steps are, are occurring in the mouse. We don't really know what all the factors are in the mouse that take this primitive cell into an islet that makes insulin. And these are too primitive to transplant into humans. So I think we're getting there. It's very, very, very exciting. This could potentially be as momentous a breakthrough as the discovery of insulin was uh, more than 90 years ago, but it's a very tough uh, nut to crack. Um, they're working hard. We have a whole group of scientists uh, working on this. Um, we're starting to actually get things ready for clinical trials, and we have the biggest multi-organ transplant group uh, in Canada here. So we have the capacity to do this, and uh, the other thing is that these scientists belong to a consortium of scientists from all over the world, and they share their ideas. So uh, we don't necessarily have to make all of the breakthroughs in Toronto. So that is a very important uh, goal of ours that could potentially be a cure for type 1 diabetes. We have another program that we've called Nutrients, the Digestive Tract and Diabetes, and this is my colleague. Professor Pat Brubaker in the Department of Physiology. And he, let me tell you about this story because it's very, very exciting. So it turns out that the gut, the bowel, we used to think was not such an intelligent organ. Sort of this tube that you put the food in and then it absorbs the food. It turns out that it's a very smart organ. And I'm an endocrinologist, so why do I think the gut is smart? because it makes hormones, okay? And so the gut actually makes a number of hormones. Um, and these hormones have a lot of actions throughout the body. And there's three stories I can tell you which are Toronto stories about discoveries of hormones made in the gut that have actually made a major impact to health. So the first one is a hormone called GLP-1 glucagon-like peptide 1. And it belongs to a family that we call incretin hormones. And what happens is, so this wasn't actually discovered in Toronto, but a lot of the groundbreaking work of how GLP-1 works was made by colleagues of mine, such as Dan Drucker and other, Pat Brubaker and other colleagues. So when people come to Toronto and they come to talk about incretins or GLP-1, they, they usually make the comment about, taking coals to Newcastle because this is the center of incretin biology. So it turns out that when you eat, this hormone comes out of these special cells in the gut, and it actually goes to the pancreas, and it gives the pancreas a kick, and it gets it to make some insulin. And so it's sort of like an early warning system for the pancreas to say, hey, there's food coming in, make some insulin. It has many other actions in the body, 
And it turns out that incretin hormones have now been harnessed for therapy. So some of the most common tablets we use to treat type 2 diabetes are based on this incretin hormone. And so that is the kind of story um, that I can tell you about in this research program called Nutrients of Digestive Tract and Diabetes. So there, the basic biology was worked on in Toronto and now has become a treatment for diabetes, for type 2 diabetes. Another gut hormone, also um, uh, this time its action as a bowel growth factor was really discovered by Drs. Brubaker and Drucker. And this GLP-2, which is a sister hormone of GLP-1, actually makes the bowel grow. And that has now gone through clinical trials and has re received approval in Europe and in uh, the United States, not yet in Canada, for treatment of what's called short bowel syndrome. So sometimes kids or adults have intestinal disease and they need a lot of surgery and it ends up that their bowel is too short to do all of the absorption of food. So they have to exist on intravenous feeding forever. And now many of these people can come off intravenous feeding with this, um, this hormone called GLP-2. A third story was by my colleague, Tony Lamb, who is uh, a really uh, just an absolute superstar working in our, uh, in our group at Toronto. And um, what he found is that the intestine has a, a way to sense the, um, the fat particles coming into it. The very first part of the intestine, just past the stomach, as the fat comes into the intestine, there's a sensing mechanism, and it sends a hormone called CCK to the brain, and the brain sends a signal to the liver, and he figured this all out in a stunning series of experiments, and that controls metabolism. So once again, an early warning system. So uh, we have way more respect for the gut than we used to have. Uh, it's a really smart organ. And uh, so we're trying to discover new hormones that control metabolism and diabetes and can ultimately be harnessed for treatment in this group. The third research program is run by my colleague, Dr. Michael Farku, who is an internationally renowned cardiologist, and uh, he is also the director of um, a, a de extra departmental unit at the University of Toronto. Um, which uh, is called the Lua Cardiovascular Heart and Stroke Center. And just like the Banty and Best Diabetes Center coordinates a lot of diabetes research, his organization coordinates a lot of cardiovascular research. I mentioned to you earlier that one of the biggest problems with type 2 diabetes is cardiovascular disease. So our groups are really working closely together. We're going to fund some projects together. Um, and try and uh, promote collaborations between cardiologists and diabetes scientists. And uh, we have some of the biggest clinical trials going on uh, at the University of Toronto in diabetes and heart disease. And so we have a lot of work going on in this area. My colleague, Dr. George Fantas, is a scientist um, who is heading up this um, program for which deals with diabetic complications. So I, I started off by telling you that diabetes is a very serious disease, and it uh, is the commonest cause of blindness, amputations, and kidney failure. So the kidneys, the eyes, and the nerves are all affected when the sugar is high, and all of that can, uh, to a certain extent, be prevented by keeping the sugars as normal as possible. But it turns out that the people who get diabetic complications, are, it's not simply related to how high their sugar is over many years. It turns out that there is also a genetic predisposition. There are some people who are incredibly lucky in that they can have high sugars for many years and never get diabetic complications, and others who are very unlucky. And we think that's a genetic predisposition. And so we're really trying to figure out what causes these we call these the microvascular complications because the small blood vessels affect these things. And we're trying to develop therapies to prevent and treat diabetic complications. We have one of the best groups in the world um, on, for example, diabetic uh, kidney disease, the ophthalmologists and, and the neurologists. When people with diabetes get pregnant, it's, a, it's another whole issue because um, it's essential to keep that blood sugar 
even better than we try and keep it in people who are not pregnant. So the, there are many complications that can occur with the pregnancy and subsequently with the neonate if we do not keep the blood sugar as close to normal as possible. And so we have entire teams working on that and we have programs at, for example, St. Michael's and Sunnybrook and uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. Denise Faig runs this. Uh, we, uh, she's been very successful in setting up uh, uh, huge clinical trials, testing this treatment or that treatment. And uh, we have um, uh, physicians who take care of patients who develop pre uh, diabetes during pregnancy or get pregnant if they have known diabetes. Um, my colleague, Dr. No Laurie McCallum, is a pharmacist in the uh, faculty of uh, pharmacy, and she has been hired uh, by the Banty and Best Diabetes Center, and in fact, uh, she is the recipient of the Sun Life Professorship, and this, uh, this uh, amazing gift that you heard about today from Sun Life has allowed us to recruit someone of the caliber of Dr. McCallum, and we... Um, this is an area, now we're getting a little bit away with the next few programs, we're getting a little bit away from what we call discovery research into areas of what we call applied research. So we actually know there is a lot that we know about diabetes. We have huge amounts of information, but this isn't all being applied by physicians, nurses, patients, pharmacists. So there is this um, idea that if you take just the existing knowledge and you apply it better, you can save millions and millions of lives. We know that there are 35,000 pharmacists across Canada. Pharmacies have deep penetration into all communities. So people with diabetes see their pharmacists a lot more than they see their doctor or the diabetes educator nurse. So the pharmacists are also looking for expanded scope of practice. They're very, very smart, and there's a lot more that they can do rather than simply dispensing medications. And as you know, they give a lot of very useful advice. They don't always have the tools they need to um, make an impact. So what Dr. McCallum and her uh, group are doing, and it's very, very exciting work, they're now working with a couple of pharmacies, uh, really trying to figure out what are the tools, the educational tools um, and uh, various things that the pharmacists need to really assist the patient with diabetes? So um, this project is just getting going, but very, very exciting. Rene Wong is an outstanding educator at the University of Toronto and this hospital, and he runs a group called Continuing Health Education and Professional Development. So part of our role at the University Health Network and University of Toronto is to actually educate physicians, nurses, the public, pharmacists, etc. We're very involved in not just research, but also education. So we run a number of programs. We've just had a very successful uh, program called a Diabetes Update at the Convention Center, where there were 600 uh, participants. We're putting things on the website. We have innovative and new methods of educating. And so we're very involved in diabetes education at various levels. We have one of the most diverse populations in Canada, particularly in its big cities such as Toronto. Dr. Lorraine Lipscomb is a diabetes expert at Women's College Hospital across the street, and she runs the program on vulnerable populations. And to study these populations, we need big databases. We need uh, information gathering, and these databases and registries don't yet exist. We have some. We have something called ISIS, which is an outstanding organization that taps into the Ontario Administrative Health Database, but we're trying to build our own databases, and we're in discussions with companies now to build that, and the first area we're going to make an impact is in our diabetes and pregnancy clinics, and so Dr. Lorraine Lipscomb and an entire team of scientists from across the University of Toronto are working on this very, very uh, interesting uh, area. Um, international diabetes outreach. We have a lot to offer countries that are developing and uh, perhaps less fortunate than Canada. And so I had a fascinating meeting this morning with this group 
um, in the Banty and Best Diabetes Center. Julia Lowe is the head of endocrinology at Sunnybrook Hospital, and she runs our international diabetes outreach. And uh, they have uh, instituted the most magnificent program with very simple educational and uh, training methods in uh, Guyana, in South America, and um, in fact, had an immediate impact by reducing amputation rates in that population that they were working in by 50%. They changed the entire culture. So there, if you had a diabetic ulcer or sore or infection on your leg, they would simply amputate the limb. And now, by adequately treating these infections and, uh, and diabetic ulcers, they don't allow the surgeons to just go in and amputate, and, and at least 50% of those limbs are, are salvaged. Um, we now want to try and extend this program to Ghana in uh, Africa, and also to Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa um, in Ethiopia. We already have a program of education in Addis Ababa, and this morning we were speaking about Ghana with uh, a, a physician who is originally from Ghana and who is already running other programs in, in Ghana. And so we're very interested in reaching out to populations outside Canada. So that is program number nine. So really, we are committed at the University Health Network and the Banty and Best Diabetes Center to the discoveries that will lead us to the cure for diabetes, but all of these other uh, programs which are making a very, very positive impact on the lives of people with uh, diabetes. So I'll leave you with this inspiring message. I'll thank you all for attending, for your attention, and uh, we certainly have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lewis. Um, we do have time for questions now. We have um, two of our staff that have microphones. So um, because we are uh, taping this presentation, we want to make sure that we can hear everybody. So if you wouldn't mind just, if you have a question, raising your hand, and one of the staff will come over, and, uh, and uh, you can speak into the microphone. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It was very clear. As a mother, I'm wondering if there's still the association between having um, children who are born at 10 pounds or greater weight and diabetes. There is. It's a, um, it's a very interesting area of research. There are many, many people uh, trying to understand that phenomenon. Um, uh, certainly, uh, large... Uh, um, weight at, at the time of birth, uh, it, it um, is a risk factor for the subsequent development of type 2 diabetes. Yes, this is true. And is there any way, is there any marker for type 1 diabetes that a child could have a blood test at birth? Um, not necessarily at birth, but there is an increasing understanding of the immune reaction that causes type 1 diabetes. And so there are various antibodies that can be measured in the blood. And in fact, uh, it's a very important area, and there are clinical trials now. Very, uh, the, the interesting thing about type 1 diabe diabetic uh, clinical trials is they've really got their act together across countries and across certainly uh, North America. So they work as a huge group. Um, it's very nice to see that type of collaboration. And um, certainly there are markers um, for type 1 diabetes that appear many, many months, even a few years, prior to the first elevation of blood sugar. Um, Right now, that's not a technique that would be done as a general screening in the whole population, and mainly because we don't yet have interventions that are going to make a difference, but certainly it's a very important research tool and is being intensively studied. Yes. And my last question, I uh, read about a, a comment by a doctor, Alyssa Zentner, um, who was referring to a 13-year study that looked at obesity and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. and whether exercise and diet could stave off some of the cardiovascular problems. 
And they had to end that early uh, because it wasn't looking like it was working. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really familiar exactly with uh, which study uh, you're referring to, but I can tell you we have a lot of evidence. So first of all, let's just make the distinction. So diet and exercise for sure can reduce blood sugar and some of the other problems. And absolutely, we have good evidence from good clinical trials like the diabetes prevention program uh, reduce the risk of getting diabetes by more than 50%, by about 50%. So we have good evidence for that. You may be referring to a study that looked at whether it reduces cardiac event rates, heart attacks and strokes. And that has been very difficult to prove in terms of diet and exercise. So that is probably what you're referring to. But certainly diet and exercise reduces the risk of subsequent development of diabetes, particularly in people at risk for diabetes. That's what I was okay. wondering, because these were people that were already obese. So yeah. my thinking is if you can catch it before you get to that obese level, well, you have more success. Well, prevention is important, but even people who are obese, and the very interesting thing is one doesn't have to get back to absolute ideal body weight. Often skimming off the top you know, 10%, or even less, of body weight can have a major impact on blood sugar, the risk for developing diabetes and those who don't already have it. So it's never too late. In actual fact, I'll take that further. In people in whom we treat who are already on diabetes therapies, diet, um, and we use the, weight, the word diet, but let's say weight reduction or trying to maintain a healthy body weight and physical activity remain the cornerstone of treatment right through even when people are on insulin. So because we want to give them less insulin or we want to give them less medications or we want less uh, likelihood of needing insulin. So diet and exercise are extremely important at every single step of the way before one gets diabetes, but even when on treatment for diabetes. So is that why the, uh, well, when you get the three level, three month level of of um, sugar test, it used to be at seven, you were diabetic, and now it's 6.5. Now what, what breaks it down from seven to 6.5? How is that decision yeah, reached? So um, let me, yeah, so I'll take that uh, as the, the last question. Um, and so let me just tell you about where 6.5 percent for the hemoglobin A1C, which is the three-month average, is the diagnostic threshold for diabetes. You're absolutely correct in saying that. And, and the reason is that we have information from big population studies, particularly with respect to retinopathy, that's damage to the, to the retina, the back of the eye, that that really increases in just a population study, there was one very good study in Egypt and, and other studies. So you're just taking a whole population and you're measuring hemoglobin A1C and you're looking for retinopathy. It really increases above a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or a fasting sugar of 7, right? They're two different measurements, 7 millimoles per liter. And so the diagnostic threshold for diabetes is based on the development of microvascular complications, particularly retinopathy, eye problems. It actually turns out that the risk for heart disease is occurring well below that, be well below that threshold of sugar. So that's the diagnostic threshold for diabetes. Now, why do we not always attempt to bring the hemoglobin A1C down to 6.5% when we have people on treatment and that's because our treatment is limited to a certain extent. So in the early stages of treatment, with certain medicines like metformin or the incretin therapies, they don't cause the sugar to go too low, hypoglycemia. They're much safer. In those people, we can target and try and bring the hemoglobin A1C down to 6.5%. But in people who are on other therapies like insulin, where there's a risk of hypoglycemia, and particularly the elderly, it's too risky to try and bring the sugar down, the hemoglobin A1C exactly down to 6.5%. So 
So we target, we bring it down to 7% or higher in a, in a fragile or elderly person. So, so we can't, uh, it's the limitation of therapy that we, we're not able to normalize sugar. Okay, so I'm, that's probably much more information than, than you want, but I guess you asked the question, so yeah, okay. Yes, I think my question's a little more elementary, but um, if you, I think your stat was that a million people in Canada are currently in a pre-diabetic state. If one is doing everything within their power to um, you know, stay active and eat properly, are there ways of finding out if one is pre-diabetic, short of having symptoms? A simple blood test. Yes, and so now it's recommended, okay, by the Canadian right. Diabetes Association that all adults should have a fasting blood glucose, right. possibly a hemoglobin A1C done every three years. So, so it's now recommended as a routine screening for adults, and it should occur. So, so it's easy to diagnose based on those two tests, the hemoglobin A1C, which is right. a three-month average, and the fasting blood glucose. And so if both of those are in a normal range, one, it's safe to assume that one is not pre-diabetic? Um, it's safe to assume that. Th there is also another test, the oral glucose tolerance test, okay, which uh, adds a little bit more information. So I could conceivably see in a, in a very small minority that they would have a normal hemoglobin A1C and fasting glucose, but have an abnormal oral glucose tolerance test. But that's a little bit of a finesse, right? As a public health issue, so it's harder to do a glucose tolerance test. It's, you know, it right. involves much more. It's more expensive, et cetera. Uh, most of us believe that a fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C is a very good screen. Um, so the best predictor of who's going to get diabetes is when, those when that sugar is already beginning to be abnormal. Mm -hmm. There are other predictors though. For example, you can have a normal hemoglobin A1C and fasting glucose, but for example, if you have abdominal obesity, put a tape measure around, or if you have, there are certain other predictors, uh, such as elevated triglycerides, et cetera, which are also predict, but the best predictor of diabetes is an already abnormal sugar. So one of the um, things that we're considering doing, I told you about Laurie McCallum's uh, work, her group in the pharmacies, and some of the work they're, they're beginning to do with pharmacists. The, the other thing we're considering um, is, of course, diabetic screening programs in pharmacies. So we, we haven't yet, we're looking into that, okay, but the way that would work there are certain questionnaires, another, another answer to your question. So there are validated questionnaires that ask for various risk factors. Mm -hmm. And based on the questionnaire, you can actually tell whether your risk is high or low. If it's low, if, so, so one way we would do diabetes screening is we wouldn't screen everybody walking into a pharmacy. We would first administer a questionnaire. Those at low risk, we would not do the blood test and those at high risk, we would do the blood test. Okay, so, so the questionnaires are quite useful as well. The real key with diabetic screening problems, you, you may say, well, why don't you just do it, is you have to have a system where you're hooking the patients up, those who you screen and are abnormal, you have to hook them up with the family physicians. That's a lot more difficult and a bigger deal. Not everyone has a family physician. So we have to think this through very carefully. There are issues with labeling. You don't just go out and screen. You can be quite naive about it and actually cause more harm than good, but, but we're certainly considering screening programs. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we only have time for one more question, but I, I will be around for a little bit afterwards. Yeah, so. Okay. One more um, okay, two more questions, so we'll so take one there. Okay, yeah. uh, my question is related to your program number two on the, uh, the digestive tracts and diabetes. Yes. Um, done by Dr. Pat. Kubroger, Baker, um, which suggested that the digestive tract is actually quite intelligent in terms of how it handles digestion. And um, is there any evidence to suggest that people with digestive issues, such as 
irritable bowel syndrome, lactose intolerance, glucose intolerance, Crohn's disease. Is there a higher correlation between that kind of symptoms and diabetes? Are they more prone to? Not really. That's a, it's a good question, really nice question. It's a little bit different. There is a correlation between one kind of disease called celiac disease, which is not that uncommon actually in the population because it's, may, it's a disease of what we call autoimmunity and there are some immune mechanism. When you have one autoimmune disease, that's a disease where your body makes an immune reaction against something, you have a high risk of another autoimmune disease. So there is a little bit of an association there with type one diabetes, but not with the conditions that you mentioned. So I'm gonna take this last question. Just, just a quick one. We've, we've tried, uh, I think, modestly successfully to attack smoking by putting big signs on the packages and so forth. Is there any att attempt in the food uh, area to actually sort of put the hit list of those things that would be worse for diabetics in people's consciousness by some sort of labeling process? Yeah, well, it's a very good question, and uh, there are uh, some attempts. I'll remind you of what uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg tried to do in New York City by banning the ultra, ultra large uh, soft drinks and, and what trouble he got into, and I think he failed, actually. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it probably will come. I, I, I think this is uh, very important, but remember, Food is much more complicated. We don't have, foods are, are mixtures of many ingredients and uh, our dietitians have actually looked into some of that. Uh, you know, how I, I was working with a dietitian um, last year who was uh, looking at exactly that to try and grade foods, common foods in a supermarket in terms of their diabetogenic effect and not. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Okay, you know, think of uh, a can of mixed up this and that, right? It's, uh, it's not that simple. It's not like just taking a piece of broccoli versus a cookie, right? So um, one needs to be quite uh, uh, careful about that. I think you have seen a trend, certain stores, like if you look at the blue menu that Ludlow's has, for example, there is an attempt to cut down on sugar, fat, and salt, et cetera. Um, but I believe that that, that will happen. Okay, but it's, it's not happening on a widespread basis right now. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Lewis, for um, such an informative, inspiring lecture. Um, I would also like to thank once again our, our representatives from Sun Life Financial for joining us today and for your amazing commitment to diabetes pre prevention. Um, if anyone here is interested in learning more about diabetes, um, you can pick up a copy of our newsletter, which is um, at our registration table. But I also wanted to um, introduce my colleague, Shauna Seabrook. Shauna Seabrook is part of our foundation and she oversees our fundraising activities related to the diabetes program, as well as the McEwen Center for Regenerative Medicine. I also wanted to point out uh, Rebecca Valenti. Many of you will um, have spoken with or communicated with Rebecca. She's our donor services officer and uh, is responsible for organizing our many events. So uh, feel free at any time to reach out to Rebecca if you have any questions about our upcoming activities or anything to do with your donation. This concludes another behind the scenes lecture. And once again, I would like to thank you so much for coming out today and for your ongoing support. Thank you. Thank you.